I want you to turn with me tonight to Revelation chapter 17, which is our text. Revelation chapter 17. And I want to read the first eight verses. Revelation chapter 17, first eight verses. I want to preach tonight on the Roman Catholic Church, past and present. Roman Catholic Church, past and present. Revelation 17 is one of the amazing prophecies in the Word of God. And one of the reasons that we believe that the Bible is the Word of God is the fulfilled prophecies. There's no book in the world like this book. Revelation 17, And there came one of the seven angels, which have the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And for literally hundreds and hundreds of years, more than a thousand years, it was believed by Bible-believing Christians that this depicted the Roman Catholic Church. And yet when we come to our day, it's widely believed that this has nothing to do whatsoever with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, popular Christian leaders like Hank Hanegraaff have said that. And he said such things as uh, to say that Revelation 17 applies to the Roman Catholic Church and that Rome has anything to do with the Antichrist is foolishness. But we don't believe that it is. We've made three trips to Rome over the years. In the last two trips, we've video recorded and, and taken digital photographs of many things uh, pertaining to the Roman Catholic Church. And so tonight, I want us to go to Rome for a few minutes before we come to this passage and, and consider what it says. Rome, the seven hills the golden cup, and the scarlet clothing. Of course, we know that Rome sits on seven hills. She's famous for that. And if you go to Rome and you purchase a map, a tour guide, uh, that very tour guide will describe the seven hills of Rome. It's not a hidden fact that Rome sits upon seven hills. And when you go to Rome, you see all of the artifacts and the old ruins pertaining to ancient Rome, the Roman Empire, such as the Colosseum, that is there. Just the remnants of it are there. You cannot see uh, uh, the, the glory that she once had. But uh, she was built by some of the Roman emperors who were infamous for their bitter persecution of God's people, such as Nero and Titus. The uh, name Colosseum comes from a giant statue of Nero that stood outside of the walls of the Colosseum. And that's where the name Colosseum or Giant comes from. And uh, in its glory days, it could seat 68,000 people. There they would have the gladiators come and fight uh, with one another, fight against wild beasts, entertaining the people in those days with the shedding of blood. But they also persecuted and uh, uh, tormented Christians in this Colosseum. Only God knows how many of his people were brutally put to death, torn apart by wild beasts in the Colosseum for the entertainment of the people in that day, in the days of the Roman Empire. You can see the place where the old chariot races were held, the Circus Maximus. 
and they would race the chariots around to the cries of the people in that day and the gambling that went on. You can see the Roman Forum, the old ruins that pertained to the government buildings, to the old temples that, that, uh, of Mercury, of Zeus, of Isis, and uh, old ruins. But one of the very interesting things for a Bible believer, in the midst of those ruins, a testimony to the authenticity of the Bible. It's the Arch of Titus. They say that it's the oldest standing arch in Rome today. And it's interesting because of the depictions that they have uh, uh, that cover the, the monument. It was dedicated to the Emperor Titus, a vicious persecutor of God's people in 85 A.D. And, and, they, and the, the scenes carved on the side of the monument depict uh, them carrying in procession some of the objects from the temple in Jerusalem that had been taken by Rome when she conquered Jerusalem in 70 A.D. and taken back up to Rome by the government. And there we can see exactly what the candlestick that sat in the, in the holy place in the temple, the very temple that Jesus uh, would have walked in, and exactly what the candlestick and what the table of showbread looks like. That's the only actual painting, so to speak, of those objects that are in existence today. But Rome fell. The Roman Empire fell and was replaced by ecclesiastical Rome. Thomas Hobbes observed that the papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire, sitting crowned upon the grave thereof, and that's exactly what it is. Rome, Roman Catholicism, has Christianized paganism. And you see that on every hand in Rome. The temple of Minerva in the old days. Rome, one of her favorite goddesses was Minerva. That temple became the church, St. Mary Minerva Church. In front of that church sits an obelisk, which was a pagan object, formerly sat in front of the temple of Isis and brought over to that church. Minerva was also the seat of the Inquisition in the city of Rome during the Dark Ages when Rome ruled over Europe. And it was there that they had the trials for Bible believers that refused to bow their knees to the Pope. One of those was a Waldensian pastor named Jean Pascal. He lived in Geneva, was educated in Geneva, and uh, he was sent on a missionary journey down to southern Italy in 1558. And as he was leaving Geneva, he said goodbye to his fiancée, never to see her again. He went down to southern Italy and was preaching the Word of God when he was captured by the Pope's minions, the Inquisitors. He was carried back up to Rome and imprisoned in a dark cell, taken out into the public arena in 1560 in September, and burned to death as the Pope watched and rejoiced as his heretic was put to death. And that's only one of multitudes and multitudes. Uh, uh, their blood was shed by the Roman Catholic Church in those days. Inside that church, St. Mary Minerva, uh, Brother Snyder had an interview with a Catholic priest. And that Catholic priest said, I am a Hindu. Brian said to him, his name is Patrick, do you have to be a Roman Catholic to go to heaven? And the priest answered, that, 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 that there is no reason whether I am a Catholic or whether he is a Hindu or whether he is a Muslim, whether he is a this thing. That God has given to each one his own. In that church, we have the burial place of one of Rome's saints, Catherine of Siena. Buried there, there's a painting that depicts her in her supposed glory, which depicts the, the doctrine of sainthood in the Roman Catholic Church, that certain specially holy people become saints and are literally glorified uh, by the Roman Catholic Church. They're pronounced saints by the Pope. And there, St. Catherine is depicted uh, with her feet over all of Europe. She's the patron saint of Europe. And uh, surrounded by angels, glorified literally. Rome got its doctrine of Mary from the pagan religions. It's very obvious. There's nothing in the Bible about Mary being the queen of heaven. 
Nothing in the Bible, not a hint that we should pray to Mary. Not a hint that Jesus is to perpetually be a little baby. Not a hint that Mary is a perpetual virgin or anything like that. Where did these doctrines come from? Not from the Bible, but from pagan religions. Many ancient pagan religions had similar doctrines to that that Rome has of Mary today. Like Isis. She's depicted as holding her little baby, God, Horus. This picture was taken in uh, Europe, in a museum that we visited in Europe a few years ago. And here's Mary with her little baby. She's also crowned. In the Vatican Library, there's a painting of Isis, clothed in blue, looking almost exactly like the depiction of Mary that we see in this, uh, this Catholic Church. Crowned with the crown. In Rome, you see many of the confessionals. And many of them are in operation. When the priest is there waiting for someone to come and to confess his sins, a light is on. Here we see a priest waiting for someone to come. He sits in the place of God. The Bible says we're to confess our sins to God. Only God can forgive our sins because of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. And no man can do that, but the Rome's doctrine is called auricular confession, and that means confession into the ear. And the priest sits there with his ear next to a screen that has holes in it. And the confessor can literally confesses his sins into the ear of the priest and seeks his absolution for that sin. The most famous church and the most important church in Rome is not the Vatican. It is St. John Lateran. And this is where the popes lived for centuries until the 14th century. And carved on the front of that church in Latin, but translated into English, are these words. Most holy Lateran, church mother and mistress of all churches of the city and of the world. And that's exactly what Rome believes. That she is the head of every church in the world. By natural right, by right of God, she says that she is the head of this church tonight. All churches of the city and of the world. And when Rome talks about ecumenism, and coming together, she only means one thing, coming back into the bosom of Rome. The headquarters for the popes were there until the 14th century. This church is famous for the Cadaver Synod. And Pope Stephen VI dug up his predecessor, Pope Formosus, and charged him with heresy. Guess what the outcome was, since he couldn't answer for himself. The oldest baptistry in Rome is in this church. It's ancient, going back probably to the days of Constantine. And it's a very interesting thing. It's a large pool originally. But in the center of that, today, there's a little baby font where they sprinkle babies. But originally, it was a large pool. Notice how deep it was, more than uh, past my waist, which, of course, there's only one reason you would use a baptistry that big for, and that's immersion. And that, of course, was the original baptism. Baptism in the Bible means burial. It means immersion. It means nothing else. And then eventually they corrupted, perverted the doctrine of the Word of God and replaced it with man-made traditions sprinkling little babies. Outside of that church, there's a obelisk that once stood at the Temple of the Sun. Yeah, what were you saying, though, about the pagan symbols? There's one that's pagan symbols. Sure. This is one the 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 highest is the highest obelisk in Rome. Mm -hmm. is uh, 3,500 years old, approximately. And everywhere you look in Rome, there's a merging of Christianity and paganism. The pillars of the altar in that church once belonged to the Temple of Jupiter. Across the street from St. John Latran are the holy stairs. And the myth is that these stairs were brought from Jerusalem by angels. And that Jesus actually walked on these stairs when he was tried by Pilate. And uh, there people crawl up these stairs on their knees seeking some sort of blessing from God because of the holiness of those stairs. And the steady stream of pilgrims go up the stairs on their knees. We've spent a lot of time at the Vatican, St. Peter's, where the Pope lives today. On one of our trips there, we got to see the Pope, the late Pope John Paul II. 
We attended a papal audience, a general audience, which is held in the front of the Vatican. The Pope came in in his Popemobile. He was very sick, of course, even then. This was 2003. He gave a speech to the crowd. Large crowd had gathered. Very enthusiastic crowd. They were shouting as he drove in, Viva la Papa! Viva la Papa! The Vatican, by the way, has a dress code that's better dress code than a lot of Baptist churches have today. Inside the largest church in the world, St. Peter's, the altar is seven, uh, five stories tall, weighs 87,000 pounds. It's very impressive. Massive, massive thing. It's a very impressive architecture, of course. The statue of Peter is there. It has a silver foot. A steady stream of pilgrims come along and kiss its foot. It's thought that this was once the statue of Jupiter that was Peterized, I guess. But this is an original statue of Jupiter. Looks a lot like Peter to me. Peter's chair is there, and it has carvings of Hercules on it. Can you imagine Peter sitting in such a chair? Can you even conceive of such a thing? The alleged tomb of Peter is there, down below the, the altar. On my first trip there in the early 1990s, I took a picture of, of an Asian couple bowing, worshiping before Peter's tomb. Candles are lit there 24 hours a day. Many of the popes are buried underneath St. Peter's, including the latest pope, John Paul II. We were in Rome when the pope was, uh, when they opened up this year, uh, to allow tourists to come along and see the Pope's burial place. We took the pictures the first day that it was open. We visited the Vatican Museum. Very interesting place. For one thing, it's full of old pagan gods and goddesses, many of which we read about in the Bible. Apollo was there, Athena, Artemis, Diana, that we read about in the book of Acts. Fortune, Hermes, Isis, Mercury. You know, they thought Paul was Mercury in the book of Acts. In the Vatican Library, the portion of it that we visited, they have actually painted on the walls old pagan gods and goddesses like Isis and Mercury. In the Sistine Chapel, you see the same thing, the famous Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo's work. Magnificent piece of art. But here you have Bible themes interspersed with pagan themes. One thing that Michelangelo did was paint uh, depictions of the Old Testament prophets on the wall. But interspersed in the midst of those Old Testament prophets that spoke by divine revelation, you have pagan uh, pagan prophetesses called sabbles all around the wall interspersed with biblical themes the famous Sistine Chapel in the Vatican Museum are is the Borgia apartments this was built for one of Rome's very famous popes Pope Alexander the sixth very immoral, wicked man. He illustrates the wickedness of many popes in the past. He was a vile man. The Roman Catholic Encyclopedia admits that. He had at least four illegitimate children. He made his son, Caesar Borgia, a cardinal when he was only 18 years old. Caesar was also an immoral, violent man, so much so that he had his brother put to death. He had his sister's husband put to death. Alexander had orgies in the, in the papal palace of that day. He died of syphilis. You find in Rome, Trevi Fountain, very famous tourist attraction. On top of Trevi Fountain, over above it, are the symbols of the Pope. You have the tiara, which is the papal crown, and the keys of Peter. That's the papal symbol. But underneath, Trevi Fountain is a depiction of Neptune, the, the pagan god Neptune, 
driving his horses out of the sea. Not exactly what Bible verse is that out of. Triton Fountain depicts the same thing. Just two illustrations of the fountains that are uh, paganized Christianity in Rome. The Tritons were sea gods. And the depiction of the Triton drinking out of a conch shell with the dragons down below. Right in the center of it are the, uh, is the symbol for the Pope, the tiara and the keys of Peter. We visited the Bone Chapel. Features the bones of 4,000 Computian monks arranged in decorative fashion. I do not know if these monks gave permission for this. There are five rooms off of a hallway. You walk down a hallway and you look into these five rooms or crypts in which these bones are arranged. And each one features a different kind of bone. There's the crypt of the skulls for obvious reasons. And it's dark in there. Very spooky place. Crypt of the pelvises. I thought that'd be a good place for Elvis to be located. The crypt of the leg and the thigh bones. And I just kept thinking about that song, Them Bones and Bones. Crypt of the three skeletons. For obvious reasons, they have entire skeletons there, including a child on the ceiling. One crypt is called the Mass Chapel, and there, not only do you have a lot of bones, but you have the heart of Maria, who is a grandniece of Pope Sixtus V that is interned there. In 1797, Pope Pius VI granted a plenary indulgence for anyone who would visit the Bone Chapel on the first Sunday in October. We've missed out on that both times. The church, this church, features the mouth of truth. Mouth of truth was an ancient river god. And it's right there as you come in the front of the church. And the, uh, the, the belief is that if you're a liar and you put your arm in his mouth, he'll eat it inside of a church. One church is dedicated to the veneration of angels in Rome. Basilica of St. Mary of the Seven Angels. And inside of that church, massive basilica, they have a, a piece of artwork called the Angel of Light. Angel of Light. Now, where do we read about an angel of light in the Bible? What about 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14? It applies to Satan. It's a description of the devil. He's the angel of light, of trying to transform himself into something that he is not to deceive people. The angel of light is not something we're to have in our churches. Paul. We visited St. Paul without the walls. Another of Rome's large basilicas. And there I observed a mass that was being conducted by high prelates in the Catholic Church. And it's very interesting that they're wearing a certain color of clothing, scarlet. And when they have the mass, they have a cup in which they have the wine. And, and the priest holds up the cup as he blesses the cup, and that cup is usually made out of a certain metal called gold. And there we see the golden cup as he's holding it up in the mass. In the Vatican Museum, you see many of the ancient golden chalices, they call them, golden cups that they use in the Mass. We visited the main Jesuit church, Jesu church, in Rome. And there they have a very interesting statue. It's called the Triumph of Faith over Heresy. And it is a depiction of Mary casting Luther and Huss out of heaven very violently. And below Mary there, and to her side, is a little angel gleefully ripping up books, the heretical books, so-called, that the Protestants had produced, or perhaps their Bible translations, which was forbidden in that day. And outside there is the plaza called Jesu Plaza. It gets its name from that church. And there's a legend in Rome. I read this in one of their tour guides that the devil in the wind went for a walk through Rome, 
And when they reached this plaza, the devil asked the wind to wait outside for him while he tended some business in the Jesuit church, and he's never come back out. Because in that little plaza, the wind always is blowing. And that's their fable about the devil and the wind and the Jesuits. I visited the church that has John, uh, John's head, John the Baptist. If you ever wonder what happened to it, it's in this box. I'm not sure that's John the Baptist's head. We visited St. Mary Major Church, the, maid, the most important Mary Church in the world. And inside that church, underneath the altar, is where they keep Jesus' manger. You go down the steps underneath the altar, and in the back, encased in gold, they say are the remnants of Jesus' manger. And every Christmas, they carry it out in the streets. They have depictions there of Mary being bodily assumed into heaven, which is one of the Roman Catholics' doctrines. They have statues of Mary, the Queen of Peace. And on the ceiling, in a dome on the ceiling, they have a painting of Jesus sitting in the throne with Mary. And Jesus crowning Mary, the Queen of the universe. The blue orb that surrounds them is a depiction of the universe. Mary, the Queen of the universe, crowned by the Lord Jesus Christ. But outside the church, you find a large crucifix about 15 feet high. And on one side is Jesus hanging on the cross. But on the other side is Mary hanging on the cross with her little baby Jesus. And that is a Roman Catholic doctrine. Uh, uh, John Paul II believed that Mary is the co-redemptress with Jesus Christ, the co-mediatrix with Jesus Christ. Most holy Theodoko save us To the healer of all mankind Hast thou given birth, rejoice, O bride of God Thou art the mystical rod From whom the unfading rose blossomed and budded for And through thee we men inherit life And filled with joy, cry rejoice to thee, O Lady Mary is literally worshipped in the city of Rome. It's said very often that uh, by Roman Catholics, we don't worship Mary. We venerate her, but we don't worship her, even though the words mean the same thing. But St. Vincent and Anastasius Church, right across from Trevi Fountain, inside there's an altar to Mary, and there is a plaque there with these words, Pope Innocent XI, initiated, these are the exact words on the plaque inside the church, the worship of this image. John Paul II was a great Mary adorer. And in May 1997, he said this, Marian worship, those were his words, Marian worship in the ecclesial community is based on the will of Christ. Mary is the path that leads to Christ, Rome. Now, in Revelation 17, I am confident that this passage depicts the Roman Catholic Church. It, ha it depicts more than the Roman Catholic Church. We know that it will not be fulfilled completely until the days that lie before us during the Great Tribulation. But... Uh, it, you would have to be blind not to see Rome in this passage. I believe that, the, that this passage and the application of this passage, the woman on the beast, is similar to that of the Antichrist. And in fact, she's aligned with the Antichrist. But in 1 John 2.18, we see that there's two aspects of the Antichrist. There's a present aspect of the Antichrist. Today, the Antichrist exists in a certain way. But there's also a future aspect. 1 John 2.18, little children. It is the last time. He's speaking 2,000 years ago. It's been the last time for 2,000 years. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, 
the one man, Antichrist, singular, shall come during the days of the tribulation, just preceding the coming of Christ. Even now are there many Antichrists, plural, now, right now, in the world, whereby we know that it is the last time. And so, John is telling us there's two aspects to the Antichrist, present and future. And I believe that's exactly what we find pertaining to the woman riding the beast in Revelation 17. There's a present fulfillment of it, and you can see that most, uh, most clearly in the Roman Catholic Church, and yet there's an ultimate future fulfillment of this during the tribulation. And it's interesting that in 1825, Pope Leo XII struck a medal bearing on one side his own image, of course, but on the other, a depiction of the Church of Rome symbolized as a woman, and in her right hand, a cup. And it had this legend underneath in Latin, the whole world is her seat. Well, it's, it's very evident that her location identifies her with Rome in verse 9. And here is the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, on which the woman sitteth seven mountains and seven hills of Rome. I don't know any other headquarters of a, of a religious entity that claims the name of Christ. It sits on seven mountains other than Rome. Her character certainly identifies this woman with Rome. We see her character in verse 1. She's described as a whore. And that is true of Rome, both spiritually and and literally, and it has always been true of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church has been associated with immorality throughout her existence. Her popes and her priests have been wicked. The Catholic Encyclopedia itself admits that many of the popes were reprobate morally. And uh, we've seen one of them already, Alexander VI, but that's just one example of many that we could give tonight. Pope Julius II had at least three illegitimate children. Pope Sixtus IV erected a house of prostitution in Rome. Pope Pius II had two illegitimate children. Pope Innocent VIII had at least two illegitimate children that he raised to positions of, of power and wealth in the Roman Catholic Church. Pope John XII was, is described in the Catholic Encyclopedia as a coarse, immoral man whose life was such that the Latran palace was spoken of as a brothel. When Luther, before he was saved, before he was converted by uh, faith uh, alone in Jesus Christ, visited Rome, expecting to find the very seat of holiness and godliness in this world. But when he left, and later on, this is what he said, if there be a hell, Rome is built over it. Rome's yeah. vileness, Rome's character identifies her with the woman that it is described in Revelation 17. Charles Chenequi, who was saved uh, uh, from the Roman Catholic priesthood, wrote the book, The Priest, The Woman, and The Confessional, describing just a little bit about the wickedness that is going on in relationship to the confessional booth in the Roman Catholic Church. But nothing has changed. In 2004, a study in the United States of America found 11,757 cases of abuse involving 5,148 priests. And that study only considered about half of the priests in America. The Roman Catholic Church is on the verge in some places going bankrupt in America because of the moral wickedness of her priest. The Archdiocese of Portland and Tucson filed bankruptcy last year because of the vileness of her priest. Her character identifies her with Rome. Her worldwide outreach identifies her with Rome. In Revelation 17:1. We read that she's a great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And the Bible is a self-interpreting book. And that is interpreted for us in verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And there's no place in this world that we can go uh, uh, to avoid Rome's influence. She is everywhere. 
in the farthest regions of the world, in places like Kathmandu, Nepal. She is there. Out in the villages, she is there. Her worldwide influence was depicted at the funeral of John Paul II in April of this year. In, uh, I was in London, England at that time doing some research into the history of the Bible. And the front page of the Evening Standard of London was emblazed in these words, united by the Pope, one of the nuns that was interviewed that had attended Pope John Paul II's funeral, said this, The entire world is here. John Paul tore down the walls of countries, of classes, of religions. The Pope's funeral was seen on television by an estimated two billion people. Are two billion people ever going to watch the funeral of a Baptist pastor? No. And it was the first papal funeral attended by 200 world leaders. At least 70 presidents and prime ministers were there to honor the Pope of Rome. It was the first papal funeral attended by the Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury. The first one attended by a British prime minister. The first Pope's funeral that was attended by a future monarch of England, Prince Charles. It was the first papal funeral that was attended by presidents of the United States. Before the papal casket, President of the United States bowed. The first papal funeral to draw an entourage of current and two former presidents of the United States. Her worldwide influence identifies her with Rome but also her unholy effect upon people identifies this woman on the beast with the Roman Catholic Church. We see in verse 2 here of Revelation 17, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunken with the wine, drunk with the wine of her fornication, drunken with the wine, her unholy effect, upon men, the very opposite of the effect that Jesus Christ is supposed to have upon men, which uh, the very opposite of what the gospel has upon men, to, to turn drunkards into sober men, to turn drug users into sober, uh, upstanding citizens. But Rome has a very opposite effect. Apostate religion allows men to continue in their sinful pleasures while having a form of religion to soothe their guilty consciences. You can see that in the mafia. You can see that in Hollywood movie stars. You can see that in Roman Catholic politicians. You can see that in Catholic countries around the world. Wherever Rome has real, real control, there is no real biblical morality there. That's why it's so ridiculous to think that Bible believers can get together with the Roman Catholic Church to bring morality to America. Rome has never brought morality anywhere. Her unholy effect upon men identifies her with Rome. Her illicit relationship with civil government identifies her with Rome. In verse 2, we see that she's aligned with the kings of the earth. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the church of Jesus Christ that we see described in the book of Acts and in the epistles in the New Testament never yoked together with the secular government. Never had a joint relationship and joined together with Caesar in any way whatsoever. The church has its business and the government has its business and they're two completely different things. And as soon as they try to band together, it corrupts both of them. But Rome has always been yoked together with the kings of this earth. In fact, there was a time for hundreds of years when she ruled over the kings of the earth. In 1302, Pope Boniface VIII issued a papal bull and he claimed that no one can be saved who does not submit to the Pope as the supreme head of the church and demanded that the kings of the earth be subject to him. That's never been rescinded, folks. Pope Gregory the uh, Seventh, called Hildebrand, humbled Emperor Henry the Fourth, humbled him, forced the emperor to stay outside of his castle. In the winter, cold and snow, barefoot, fasting for three days. Pope, the Pope humbling this emperor before he was even allowed into the Pope's presence. Pope Innocent III humbled 
King John of England in the 12th century, early 13th century. The king of England did some things which displeased the Pope. And so the Pope excommunicated him. And the Pope declared that he's no longer king. And his subjects are no longer subject to him. The Pope called for France and other countries to raise armies and go overthrow uh, uh, the King John of England. So the king submitted and gave his entire nation over into the hands of the Pope in a solemn a, a vow that the king made. Apostasy does not hesitate to yoke together with godless men in secular government or in false religions to accomplish its purposes. Godless religion operates not by the word of God, not by thus saith the Lord, not by this being the sole authority for faith and practice. Godless religion operates on pragmatism. What works? But that's not how we're supposed to operate. And so apostates will, will yoke together and, and, and create organizations and, and uh, unities and political alliances. The word of God forbid, such as the moral majority, and anything like that. Her blasphemy identifies her with Rome. In verse 3, we're told that she's blasphemous. In fact, she's full of the names of blasphemy. Here is a, a religious institution that's being described. A religious institution. And yet, full of the names of blasphemy. What about the titles of the popes? What are some of their titles? One of them is Holy Father. And yet, they're not supposed to be fathers. They're not married. And they're certainly not holy. No man is holy. No man can take that name but Almighty God. Holy Father is the name of God. One of the names of the Pope is His Holiness. There's only one that can bear that name, and that's Almighty God. Jesus Christ is His Holiness. One of His names is the Vicar of Christ. The representative of Christ. But that is the title of the Holy Spirit who's come down from heaven into this world to represent Jesus Christ at this particular time. Rome's priests, when they're ordained, they literally lie flat on the floor in front of the bishop that's ordaining them. And they are ordained after the order of Melchizedek. Anyone familiar with the book of Hebrews knows that there's only one man that fits that, that can possibly be ordained after that order, and that is Jesus Christ. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. What about Mary being crowned the queen of the universe? What about Mary being called the queen of peace? There's only one prince of peace. But there is no prince, queen of peace sitting in Christ's throne. What about Mary hanging on the very cross with Jesus? Blasphemy. Her clothing identifies her with Rome. In verse 4, even her clothing is described. She's arrayed in purple and scarlet color. That's amazing because... Only one religious institution that names the name of Christ today clothes itself in scarlet and purple, and that's Rome. We saw that tonight in some of the pictures that we've taken of the masses. Her wealth identifies her with Rome. Her wealth is described in verse 4. She's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Her wealth, that certainly doesn't describe independent Baptist churches. I've preached in independent Baptist churches in many parts of the world. I've never seen an independent Baptist church that, uh, that this describes. Not even close. But it describes Rome. She grew wealthy through the tithes that she collected. She grew wealthy by the doctrine of masses for the dead. She grew wealthy through the indulgences that she sold and still sells. Now, that's how the Vatican was built in the days of Luther. She grew wealthy during the Inquisition when the Inquisitors were allowed to confiscate the property of those that they arrested and put to death. Her wealth identifies her with Rome. Her cup identifies her with Rome. Her cup is described also in verse 4 as a golden cup in her hand. Golden cup. Of course, there's only one place in the New Testament that a cup is described, and that's pertaining to the Lord's Supper. And in the Lord's Supper that Jesus has given us and instituted for us in the Word of God, we take the bread which depicts and typifies His body and then we break it 
typifying His body that was broken for us. And then the cup in which the, the juice of the grape is there, symbolizing the blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross. A simple memorial meal reminding us of the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that He's done to save us from our sins. But Rome has taken that simple memorial meal and corrupted it into this, this pageantry called the Mass. And Rome has a cup that she uses in the Mass. And until recent years, it was required that the cup of the Mass, which only the priests drink from, the people only take the wafer, but which the priest drank from and which has the wine in it was required by Catholic law to be gold or at least gold plated. And until this day, the papal chalice is always made out of gold. Her cup identifies her with Rome. I've taken the Lord's Supper in many independent Baptist churches around the world. And I've never seen a golden cup. I've seen plastic. I've seen wood. I've seen tin. But I've never seen a golden cup. Her abominations identify her with Rome. Verse 4, her cup's full of abominations and filthiness of a fornication. And uh, what about her love affair with bones? To mention only one abomination. Bones are supposed to be buried, not decorate the ceilings of our churches. Her love affair with bones. Her associates identify this woman with the Roman Catholic Church. In verse 5 we read, that she's a mother. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Mothers have daughters. Rome has many daughters. The Protestant denominations in the 15th, 14th, 16th and 17th centuries split away from the Roman Catholic Church and went away from her, not far enough, not all the way back to the Word of God. Not all the way back to the New Testament pattern. But they went away from her. But today they're going back. Becoming reaffiliated with Rome. The Church of England is going back to Rome. The Methodist churches are going back to Rome. The Lutheran churches are going back to Rome. Presbyterian churches are going back to Rome. Evangelical, the very term, means Protestant. And today they're realigning themselves with the Roman Catholic Church. Just look at Billy Graham throughout his long ministry in life, affiliating closely with the Roman Catholic Church, repeatedly uh, making pilgrimages to the Vatican to literally meet with the popes. And he describes those meetings as a fellowship in Christ, turning Tens of thousands of his converts over into the hands of Roman Catholic priests. Her associates identify her with Rome. And also her violence identifies this woman with the Roman Catholic Church. We read in verse 6 that she is drunken with the blood of the saints. Protestants did some persecution. Protestant churches persecuted Baptists. Their favorite means of persecuting Baptists was to drown them. They said, you want to be baptized? We'll baptize you. And they did. They drowned many. But the religious institution that names the name of Christ that has shed the most blood by far is the Roman Catholic Church. It's been estimated by careful and reputed historians of the Catholic Inquisition that 50 million people were put to death for the crime of heresy by Roman Catholic persecutors between A.D. 606 and the middle of the 19th century, she was still shedding blood. That's from John Dowling's History of Romanism, which was published in 1847. Rome. Does Rome have anything to do with Revelation 17? I think you would have to be blind not to see that it does. How could it not? My friends, tonight the hour is very late. The hour is very late. It's, it's time to do something tonight. It's time for one thing, to be saved. Roman Catholic Church and other apostate churches teach that we're saved by grace through the, plus the church. But the Bible teaches that we're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ alone because of His blood alone through faith alone. 
And that if you're not born again, Jesus said, you'll never see the kingdom of God. And being born again is not water sprinkled on me when I'm a little baby. But being born again is when I'm old enough to put my faith and my confidence in Jesus Christ, acknowledging that I am a wicked sinner and that there's only one thing that I deserve, that I'm such a sinner that I deserve eternal hell, that only through the blood and what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary can I go to heaven. Amen. That's what born again is. Right. It's time to be saved because the hour's late. The Bible only gives us today. It's time to be watching for Christ's return. In Romans 13, verse 11, the Word of God tells us that we should be doing this. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed, and that was written 2,000 years ago. It must be very near tonight. It's time to be watching for the return of Christ. It's a time tonight to be spiritually discerning. In light of what is happening in religious world, in light of the warnings that were given in the Word of God to, to be sober, to, to be diligent, to prove all things, to, to judge righteous judgment, to, to discern between false prophets and true prophets. It's a time tonight, if there ever was a time, to be spiritually discerning like the Bereans who took the Word of God and tested everything by the Word of God to see if it was true or false. Amen. But the average Christian, even in an independent Baptist church, my dear friends, from 32 years of experience, I say this, but not proudly, is, is ignorant of the Word of God. Does not spend the time in the Word of God it takes to know the truth so that you can discern the truth from the things that are false. It's a time to be discerning. It's a time tonight to be in a strong church. The Bible warns. Uh, uh, to not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And so much more as you see the day approaching. And we do see the day approaching. And so one thing that we need in these days is a strong church. The church is a family to protect us in, in the midst of this wicked world, in the midst of all the spiritual dangers that are out there. It's a time to be in a strong church. It's a time tonight to warn others that the hour's late. That's every believer's job. That's not just preacher's job. To stand up and speak for Jesus Christ, even to earnestly contend for the faith. That's every child of God's responsibility. And it's time to do that before it's too late. It's also a time tonight to be separated. That's become almost a dirty word in many churches. One reason, when I was saved in 1973, I was 23 years old. And I had been a hitchhiker and a drug user and a very foolish young man after I came back from Vietnam. And, uh, and the Lord saved me that summer, sent a Christian man to me who witnessed to me. And in a motel room in Daytona Beach, Florida, I repented of my sin and received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and my life was changed. And one thing I began to pray about earnestly was, where do I go to church? And I had grown up in a Southern Baptist congregation. And I thank the Lord for my mother and daddy, and I thank the Lord that they took me to church. And I thank the Lord that I heard the gospel there. And there's quite a few things that I thank the Lord for that I did get in that church. But, but I knew that I was never going to go back to a Southern Baptist church because they don't believe in separation. And the Word of God commands it. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. It is commandment. In Romans 16, verse 17, for example, the Word of God says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, and avoid them. That's not hard to understand. You don't have to go to the Greek to understand that. Avoid means stay away from them. Avoid means if you see that they're teaching contrary to the Word of God, don't go to their churches. Don't go to their Bible studies. Don't read their books that you find in the bookstore. Don't listen to them on the radio and television. Avoid means avoid. It's a time to practice that because separation is a matter of protection from spiritual danger. It's not a hateful thing. It's not a mean thing. It's not an unloving thing. God is not tra trying to take away from us something that will uh, uh, be a blessing to us. God is trying to protect us from spiritual dangers. The same reason that we try to protect our children from wicked men. The Word of God warns that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. 
The Word of God says, be, uh, be not deceived. Evil communications, associations corrupt good manners, good Christian living. And it does. Any church, any preacher that speaks well of Rome today is disobedient to the Word of God and should be avoided on the authority of the Word of God. And that includes Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, Bill Bright, Campus Crusade for Christ, Chuck Colson, James Dobson, Elizabeth Elliott, Jerry Falwell, Bill Hybels, D. James Kennedy, uh, J.I. Packer, Louis Palau, the Radio Bible Class, Robert Schuller, John Stott, Joseph Stoll, Wycliffe Bible Translators, United Bible Societies, Bible Society of America, Jack Van Impey, Wheaton College, World Vision, Philip Yancey, Youth for Christ, and I could go on and on. Those that speak well of Rome, speak of her in soft terms, should be avoided because it's disobedience to the Word of God. We're to stand up for the truth. Yeah. We're not only to believe the truth, we're to take a stand for it. That's what we see in the Word of God. Paul, every place you see Paul, you see him fighting for the truth. You see him taking a stand for the, uh, the doctrines of the Word of God, getting involved in doctrinal controversies wherever he went. Almost every epistle that Paul wrote, he was involved in some sort of doctrinal controversy for the truth's sake. We don't hate anyone. Baptists have never persecuted anyone. To my knowledge, I've studied church history pretty diligently. I have a massive library, a lot of rare old books on church history. Not once have I ever seen or read that Baptists persecuted anyone. We don't believe in that. When we talk about standing from the truth and separating from those that are uh, involved with false doctrine, we don't, talk, we don't mean that we hate anyone. We don't mean that we wish ill on anyone. We simply mean that we want to obey the whole counsel of God. Warning and correction is not persecution. Rome, past and present. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord, for the... Uh, opportunity tonight to to preach this message. I pray that you'd bless, Lord, uh, the Word of God that we've heard tonight to fortify our lives, Father, in the battles that we face today. And Lord, that whoever would hear this would be encouraged and strengthened uh, by the Holy Spirit. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.